So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jerry Markowitz, and uh, we are in for a real treat today listening to uh, Professor Perez. Um, and just by way of introduction, that, um, you know, uh, I have admired Professor Perez for many, many years. He has been such an incredible addition to John Jay and to the scholarly community in general. And just to give you a sense of his accomplishments, and I've, this is a very abbreviated version because we want to hear him. Uh, just last year, he won the prize for scholarly excellence in Cuban studies awarded by the Cuban section of the Latin American Studies Association and this is an annual prize for lifetime achievement in the field. Um, he uh, got uh, the Faculty uh, Scholarly Excellence Award from the Office for the Advancement of Research here at John Jay. Uh, he has won the Herbert H. Lehman Prize for Distinguished Scholarship in New York History that was awarded by the New York Academy of History for his uh, really outstanding book, Sugar, Cigars, and Revolution. And um, that book, uh, which was published by um, NYU Press, uh, publishes weekly called A Colorful and Scrupulously Research History and an Engrossing Work, and um, it, it is. It is really absolutely uh, magnificent. He has been invited to present his work in uh, Havana, in Spain, at Princeton, Yale. And uh, before I expire from this earth, I want to <laughs> sometime do your uh, tour of Greenwood Cemetery, which is uh, 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 supposed to be an absolutely wonderful, wonderful uh, tour. Uh, he has also received grants from the U.S. Department of Education, the New York Public Library, uh, where he won the prestigious Coleman Center for Scholars and uh, Writers Fellowship. He's gotten awards from the Ford Foundation and from the National Endowment for the Humanities and many, many more. But today we're here to um, uh, have him talk to us about his uh, most recent book, The House on G Street, A Cuban Family Saga, um, that was uh, published last year. And it is really um, a personal story, it is a memoir, um, but also a uh, incredible examination of uh, Cuban history. And so without further ado, uh, Professor Perez. Thank you, Professor Markowitz. I, I should say that, uh, that Jerry's a friend of mine, just in the interest of full disclosure, <laughs> in terms of all the nice things that he's just said about me. Um, actually, uh, uh, he's been a, since I arrived at John Jay, he's been a mentor to me, especially when I was navigating the uh, difficult waters of being department chair of uh, Latin American and Latinx studies. Uh, I also wanted to invite him here, not only because of his credentials, but because I know he's read the book. <laughs> but he, did, he, he didn't say anything about the book, right? <laughs> but maybe he'll do <laughs> later on, okay? Uh, so uh, thanks very much for the invitation uh, to be here. Um, I want to thank the Office for the Advancement of Research. I want to thank, uh, of course, Anthony Carpi, uh, Dan Stageman, and not only for having invited me here, but also because um, they gave me a faculty research award back in the spring of 2022, which enabled me to give the book a, a final push. Uh, and of course to Reni uh, Bahati uh, for all the logistical work here in setting this up. Uh, and again, thanks again, Jerry, for, for accepting to invite me. Uh, I wanted to recognize in the audience the provost, uh, Allison Pease, who is here. Um, and um, also to my students, many of whom are here. It's the power of extra credit, right? <laughs> right? It's always, it kind of works, right? Right? How many are my students in my class? Wow, okay, there you go. 
Okay, good. Uh, some students from before as well of the semesters. Anyway, uh, five, five years ago, um, in, in also another book presentation of the Office for the Advancement of Research, I presented my book that Jerry mentioned, Sugar, Cigars, and Revolution, The Making of Cuban New York, which is a book about uh, the Cuban community in New York in the, in the 19th century, uh, which I spent a lot of time doing a lot of research on. And I presented it precisely, almost exactly to the day, like five years ago. Um, it was up actually in the moot court. Um, and that book, uh, in that book, I discovered that I enjoyed greatly telling the stories of these families from Cuba who had settled in New York in the 19th century, who were very much involved in export, importing sugar, were involved in cigar uh, manufacturing, cigar importing tobacco leaves, and also in the revolutionary movements that have, were really centered in New York at that time. And I, 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 it was so interesting to me to tell that story through looking at these various families that lived in here in New York. Let me look at the time. I want to allow enough uh, time for questions. Um, and I thought, you know, now that I finished saying all these family stories about these people that I didn't know, I said, you know, maybe I sa should say the story of my own family uh, because uh, it's been a topic I've been researching, researching all my life, right? Um, I was, for, for better or worse, I was a very quiet child, uh, always asking questions, right? In fact, my, uh, my great aunt, uh, Consuelo once told my mother, Ay, Nancy, este niño es un viejo. <laughs> <laughs> this child is an old man, right? Uh, in the sense that I was always sort of, you know, uh, and I listened very well, and I listened to a lot of family stories. And so I accumulated those over time. I, I acquired some later. I, as a researcher, since, you know, I got my PhD, and even before that when I was in graduate school, I, I have been accumulating materials through research. Of course, everything that's come in through the internet and ancestry and whatever has given a tremendous boost to that, right? So I realized after I finished that other book that I said, you know, this is a book that I've got to write uh, because um, it's something that I've accumulated throughout my life, all these stories and, and, and all these, uh, this information, all this research, all these documents, right, that I've accumulated throughout my life uh, and uh, I am about the only one of the descendants of my grandparents right, who uh, knows all this. Uh, there are now about 80 uh, living uh, descendants of my four grandparents. Right? I am among the oldest one in terms of the surviving ones, right? but they don't, have, they don't have any idea of any of this. So I said, let me, let me write this down because, you know, uh, I think it's the sort of thing that people sometimes do research on, and, but I've done, I've done it, and I can share this with, you and with them and leave this legacy. But of course, I couldn't just write these stories and just center it on my family. In order for me to really understand the life of my ancestors and the lives of my ancestors and those who, who came before me, I can, I had to put it like a good sociologist, because I'm actually not a historian, you know, my PhD is in sociology, so I'm just passing off here as a, as a, uh, as a historian. Um, it, it, you know, what I need to do is contextualize these stories. That is, place them in their proper historical context, especially during the Cuban Republic. And again, the Cuban Republic from 1902 to 1958. And at at the very basic thing, right, this book is really a book, I consider it, of Cuban history uh, that is written from the perspective of my family, in which I've used my family, essentially, right, to tell a micro-history of the Cuban Republic. How these historical events that many people have written about actually played themselves out close to the ground. How they, how they actually affected, and it, it was a turbulent history, right? It was a very turbulent history, going back to the colony, right? But also during the Cuban Republic. Uh, and so I, 
I, I said, I need to contextualize this uh, and, and understand their lives in the context of that. But also looking at it through the other end of the telescope, right, what this also enabled me to do was to, I think, make a contribution to Cuban history, I think, by looking at how these forces played out in a particular family. So at the same time that I was wanting to tell a family story contextualized in, fam in, in, in Cuban history, I wanted to tell a story of Cuban history through the lens of my family. So, so that's the kind of uh, thinking that went into, uh, into this. Um, and it did involve, in the last, oh, uh, 10 years or so, it's been involved, while I was even working on the other book, it involved doing a great deal of research. And I mean even the National Archives and, and so forth, right? So um, that's been the focus, essentially, of, of the book. And what I argue is that both families, that is, my mother's family and my father's family, right, who married in 1948, right, both of those families were very different in many ways, in the ways in which, for example, they became, in many ways, elite families in Havana society by the 1940s. Right? But they, they came through very different paths. And s but although their stories are very different, they are both emblematic, I think, of what happened during the Cuban Republic especially. Okay? So let me give you some idea of, of the structure of the book. Right? Uh, and it, is, it does deal, I mean, there's been a lot of work recently done, uh, especially among, African Amer among uh, you know, historians of African Americans using family histories and using this concept of microhistory to tell this sort of lost story, right? Uh, my story is part of that, but it's not part of that because unlike the stories that are being written about African Americans who were, again, people who were, you know, at, at, treated at the margins of society, right? My family was somewhere near sort of elite levels of Cuban society. So in that sense, it is not that sort of history, right? But it is a history of a lost world because the stories of those families, right, the world that they inhabited has been lost. Right? And many people, given the historiography that's been written about the Cuban Revolution, in which, again, especially it's been very negative, with some good reason, right, in terms of how the Cuban Republic developed and, and so forth, given that historiography, it's always been treated in a very negative sort of light and in a very general way, and in a very almost stereotypical way. What I wanted to do was not necessarily challenge that, but to say, let's look at it at a more human level, and let's see how you know, these families navigated these you know, process, this historical processes through all these years. Okay. So I don't hide the kind of elite focus of the book. Right? In fact, I consider it one of its strengths because it addresses precisely that history, which again is fairly unknown to most Cubans. Anybody who lives in Cuba, for example, or even that don't live in Cuba, but any Cubans less than 60 years of age, right, have almost no idea of how life was like before the revolution. The only clue that they have are its architectural remnants, and those are the ones that we always hear about, right? These sort of ruins of Havana that presumably were of another age, right? But which, you know, but they don't know a great deal about the people who inhabited those houses, who built all that, and that in many ways were the ones who, for better or for worse, built the Cuban Republic, okay? So that's part of what, I'm, what, I'm, what I want to do here. And so I, I do give free reign without any, without any, um, judgment, uh, without any, um, you know, uh, excuses or whatever, I do give free reign to what we might consider a somewhat elite focus of the book, okay? So the structure of the book is this. I start essentially with my mother's family, which is the one that I have the earliest information on when they arrived in Cuba. And they arrived in Cuba in 1823, right, from uh, Torre de Embarra, uh, which is a town just uh, south of Barcelona. So they were Catalanes, right? Their last name was Fonts, F-O-N-T-S, which is a Catalan name, right? They arrived in, uh, in Cuba, and they actually did some very good marriages, 
right, uh, to enter into the world that was developing in Cuba at that time around the sugar revolution, which there were fantastic wealth to be made. They were not among those who made great wealth or anything, but they married well, right? Uh, so much so that one of my great-grandfather's sisters married Miguel de Aldama, as in the Aldama Palace, right, in Cuba, and they were probably the richest family in Cuba, right? The story, so that's, the, that's, that's, that starts with them. Then I also follow the story of my father's family. Their, their uh, history way back is less known because my grandfather on my father's side uh, was an orphan from the central region of Cuba around Remedios, right? And uh, those are, there are two principal characters, if you will, in this story. One is my great-grandfather on my mother's side and my grandfather on my father's side. Even though one was a great-grandfather and one was a grandfather, they were born only two years apart, okay, back in the 1870s. Uh, and those two stories are the ones that anchor the narrative. And so I switch, one chapter is devoted to the fonts, then I switch over to the other family, to the Perez family, to the fonts, to the Perez family. So I'm, I'm, I'm tracing this history through the eight, through the colony, through the Cuban Republic, and then the book ends when I leave Cuba. This is not this is not a Cuban American book, right? There's a lot of there's a lot of books uh, written that are sort of memoirs and so forth of uh, Cuban Americans who talk about their adjustment to life in the United States. No, that's not this is not it. This is as I like to take, this is a Cuba Cuba book. In other words, it has to do with you know, Cuba, well, and it ends when I leave Cuba. So those are the two bookends, essentially, of the book. Um, the, the, the two figures, as I was saying, that, that anchor this narrative are these two, that my great-grandfather uh, on my mother's side and my grandfather on my uh, father's side. And they were very different. Uh, my great-grandfather on my mother's side came from, again, a family that had established itself rather well in Havana society. Like I said, one of his you know, aunts um, uh, married uh, Miguel de Aldama, and others made also very advantageous marriages. But this particular great-grandfather, although many of them were pro-Spanish and so forth, this great-grandfather joined the Army of Independence uh, for Cuba in 1895. Right? So he became what was known in Cuba as a mambi. Right? Uh, that is, he fought against the Spanish uh, 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 colonialism, and he climbed the ranks. Uh, he had been educated in the United States in a uh, 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 military school, in high school, uh, in the Hudson Valley. So he knew English, right? Uh, and, uh, and he knew a bit about bookkeeping as well, which is where he got his degree. So he quickly climbed the ranks until he was essentially the Secretary of the Treasury of the rebel government, right? So he was in the cabinet of the government in arms. Once, of course, that war is over, the U.S. steps in, he knows English, he knows bookkeeping, he works for the auditor of the government that came in from the U.S. and intervened, right, from the U.S. military government of Cuba from uh, 1899 to 1902, uh, and he served as deputy auditor, the only Cuban employed by the auditor's office. Uh, in the U.S. And this took me, of course, to the National Archives where there are the records of the military government of Cuba and there's cart full, I mean, there's like 10 carts of records of that government, right? And invoices and everything that he signed and so forth. So it took quite a bit of, of research to really, but he's the one who's left the greatest mark on Cuban history, essentially, of all my uh, ancestors. Uh, he then became the auditor for the Cuban Republic and in 1906, he was named uh, the minister, the, uh, essentially the secretary of the treasury for the government of Cuba. That government did not last very long. Uh, and he died, uh, he died a untimely death in 1918. Right. On my father's side, my grandfather, Lisandro Perez, who was, again, had the same name as I did. Oh, actually, I have the same name as he did. Uh, he was, he was, he was, uh, he is I'm the oldest of his grandchildren, right? Of the oldest of his grandsons, I should say, and the, the son of his oldest son, so I have the name. Uh, he was a poor boy from Remedios who built 
a fortune, literally, right, uh, from the ground up, uh, buying tobacco from vegueros, right, from tobacco farmers, processing that tobacco and selling it in the United States. He didn't make cigars, right? He exported leaf tobacco that then the Americans bought to blend with the cigar with cigars they were making in New York and so forth. Eventually the General Cigar Company, which now makes Macanudos, right, bought him out, right, essentially, and put him in charge. Right? So he ran that company for the Americans starting in the 1930s. The story of these two men, and again the other stories as well, but particularly the stories of these two men, have to do with two other themes, related themes that I that I tease out in the book. One was really the political precariousness of the Cuban Republic. Right? That is, the Cuban Republic was plagued by interventions, by revolts against elections, by fraudulent elections, right? Uh, and, and my great-grandfather at the beginning of the Republic was in the middle of all of this. And I'm able to place his story within the context of that precariousness of the Cuban Republic. Related to that precarious, precariousness, fragility of the Cuban Republic, right, is the fact that starting very early in the 20th century, even before then, but especially in the 20th century, the U.S. had this tremendous influence, right, in Cuba. And that's part of also the theme here, right. Uh, there's a tendency to blame the U.S. for everything, right. Part of what I illustrate with these stories is that, yes, the Platt Amendment, which came in, and, uh, and it was imposed on Cuba by the U.S., didn't help things, but also Cubans behaved badly, right? They actually behaved badly. And that's part of the reason, right, that there was this turmoil of the Cuban Republic, which I also talk about. I think my purpose in all, in all of this is to get to the point where I'm born, <laughs> in, the sense that, in the sense that Part of the motivation of the book is to understand why I had the childhood that I had in Cuba in the 1950s, right? which was, in many ways, a thoroughly American childhood, if you will. Right? My father, who was educated in the US, in Long Island, in fact, his uh, father sent him to study in Long Island because he wanted him to learn English. My grandfather on my mother's side, the son of the Colonel, who had also been educated in the U.S., was also educated in the U.S. in New York Military Academy, right? Uh, and so I grew up with all these sort of New York stories, and my father decided that instead of putting me in the Jesuit school, like uh, properly I should have been placed in the Jesuit school or the La Salle brothers or whatever, I would go to an American school. So my experience was of this bilingual, bicultural world Right, in which I grew up by t having classes in English in the morning right, and in Spanish in the afternoon. U.S. history in the morning, Cuban history in the afternoon. Right? And that's part of what I talk about. At that point, the book kind of becomes a memoir. But I want to stress that the b I don't consider the book a memoir in the sense that my memory, when it comes in, uh, is only part of the body of data that I use to tell the story, right? Which I join also with, again, family stories, which I join with research, right? By the way, one of the things about researching family history is that you find out that some of the things you've been told are not true, <laughs> right? <laughs> are not true at all, right? There's sort of, there's an attempt always to glorify the ancestors, if you will, right? There's always an attempt to glorify the ancestors. A and so I did debunk uh, and one of the things that I'm, I'm kind of proud of, but has gotten me into some trouble, uh, is that my older uh, family members, which were my, my mother's aunt, who is still alive, and she's 91, and my uncle, my, mo uh, my mother's brother, who is now 84 or so, uh, uh, I've read the book, they, and part of what they've said, particularly my aunt, who has been at She's also my godmother, my madrina, said, I didn't know that, <laughs> right? And I was like, yeah, how did you dig all this stuff up, right? Because, for example, on the font side, the colonel died when my grandfather was 13. So the transmission of, of family history gets a little broken up, right? So what survives are these sort of fables, right? These sort of, you know, stories of heroism, 
about you know the grandfather who fought in the war and so forth. Right? Um, but I, some of that research that I did also, uh, I think that one of the more interesting chapters that I have is really an ethnographic chapter in which I devote an entire chapter right, to my grandfather's tobacco business in which I detail right, the process by which he bought from the vegueros, from the tobacco farmers, processed that tobacco and shipped it to the U.S. And that process would take from six to seven years, right? And it was something like even more complicated than making wine or scotch or something, you know, uh, processing an agricultural product into a, into a, uh, a, a, you know, um, fine product for international, you know, for international consumption. Uh, and the reason, I, the way I got that information is, first of all, I interviewed people in Camajuani, which was the town where my grandfather's operations were centered. Um, and, and they told me a lot about it, but also when, for a time, I lived with my father when I was between marriages. I lived with him, and I said, why don't you write this down for me? Because he worked in his father's business. And of course, since he had nothing to do because he was retired, he started writing. And he left me a whole thing very detailed on precisely this process and how it happened, essentially from, you know, beginning to end, right? How, you know, and it was interesting. It was, I mean, I think, I don't think it's ever been written up how, what was the tobacco processing, what, what was the process of, 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 you know, making that tobacco and what was the, the uh, process of buying it from the Vegeta all the way to shipping it to New York, right? And it shows also how Despite the fact that my, the Americans bought out my grandfather, he continued to be in charge of operations because the Americans said, who's going to know more than he about running this business? He knows the tobacco farmers. He knows this whole thing. So they actually you know, told him, okay, you'll be in charge of the General Cigar Company of Cuba LTD, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of the General Cigar Company. And he was the one that made decisions, right? Sometimes they would tell him here from New York, their offices were on 41st Street. Why, don't you, why aren't you buying tobacco? Why aren't you buying at this price? And he would say, if you want to buy at this price, you come down here and buy. But I'm in charge of operations. The other thing was that the Vegueros were paid from money wired from Citibank in New York to Havana to the different locations in Cuba. So that a Vegueros selling his tobacco product right, was actually tied to an international financial system. Okay. Let me explain the title. Okay. Let me explain the title, The House on G Street. This is the way my family, this was the, the house that my grandfather, again, the tobacco person, because he had a lot more money, despite the fact that my mother's family had kind of a more elite status, family background, uh, veterans, of the, uh, ver veterans of the war, and so forth, right? Uh, my, my grandfather, my father's, I had more money. He had made more money, even coming up as an orphan, right? And part of it was because he didn't get involved in politics. This was a very important idea, right? My, my, my the great-grandfather who fought in the war, when he came out of the war, he had no money. And the only way he could really make a living was through the public bureaucracy, which of course brought him into this entire world, right, of, of the conflicts of the Cuban Republic and so forth and, you know, uh, uh, stolen elections and the whole thing, right? Uh, but my grandfather on my father's side never got involved in politics. He had been an orphan boy who worked very hard at his business, and he wasn't going to get involved in politics. This was part of the whole idea, and I think jo uh, John Gutierrez commented on this uh, when, on another occasion, of the idea that for many people, politics was dirty business in Cuba, right? You just didn't get involved in it. And those were the two different stories, right, of why. So this house on G Street was built by this grandfather who made all this money. He built it in 1929, right? It's a house, um, it's still there. Uh, and the reason that I, that I center the house there is uh, because in many ways, that is a reference point for me for Cuba. So at this point, what happens sometimes in these things is that I, I read a part of the book, if that's okay. And then, um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll quit and we'll do questions, right? So I'll, I'll start from the beginning, okay? So I'll start from the beginning because it explains 
essentially um, why I called it the house on G Street. And by the way, this is a photograph of G Street, right? It's La Calle G, and that is the way my family referred to the house, was La Casa de la Calle G, right? So that's why I borrow that, right, as the title of the book. And that's, how I, that's uh, looking up G hey, to the monument to Jose Miguel Gomez. So let me just read how I connect this at the very beginning of the, of the course, of the book. And again, this book is, is, like I said, it has a lot of research in it, but it is written in the first person. That is, it's meant to be a personal sort of story, right? So, I sit once more on the bench directly across from the house on G Street. It's October 2015. There are many benches on the promenade that runs along the median of the street. But during my visits to Havana, I always sit on this bench, the one facing the house. I sat here with my father in the year 2000, on the day of his 80th birthday, during his only trip back to Cuba since he left the island 40 years before. We both sat on the bench for a long time, gazing at the house and saying almost nothing. We can't go in and visit the house, I told him, because it's a daycare center full of toddlers, and we can't just walk in unannounced. We would not be welcomed. He did not question that, and I was glad he did not. At this distance from the bench, the house did not look too different from when he lived there for 18 years, from the time he was 10 years old to the moment he left the house in a tuxedo with tails to marry my mother. The house's exterior still had the reddish-brown color of unpainted stone, just as when it was first built. The tall iron fence that encloses the property was intact, as was the colonnade that frames the front portico. As seen from the bench, one of the columns even mercifully covered the sign near the front door that proclaimed the daycare center's name, Vietnam Heroico. Okay. Uh, when I visited that, and with my father, uh, later on, uh, after my father, I was there with my father, the house had been closed. The daycare center had closed because the, fa the house was, was facing uh, a lot of decay. Part of the roof had fallen in and everything else, and I was concerned that they would actually, you know, um, close the house, and I was really concerned about that. Um, so I go on and say, the closure, the possible closure of the house made me realize the depth of my emotional connection with the house on G Street, a connection I still do not quite understand. I never lived there. When my parents married, they went to live in an apartment in Miramar, a new suburb at the time. I lived in that apartment until 1960, when I was 11 years old and my parents decided we would leave the country. But every Sunday, my parents, my brother and I would join my uncles and aunts and their children for lunch at the house on G Street. Perhaps it was the sense of belonging that came with those weekly lunches with uncles and aunts doting over every niece and nephew <coughs> and with all those cousins as playmates. The house gave my life a sense of stability with its spaciousness and solidness. I knew my grandfather had built it and that my father and his siblings had grown up in it. I imagined what it must have been like to have lived there at the time my father was a child and how the house and its occupants shaped my life in many ways. The house was the physical repre representation of my family legacy, uh, my family legacy, and once I, was I no longer lived in Cuba, it became in my mind the reference point for everything that had been and would never be again. The house on G Street became Cuba for me. So that's the explanation of why I called this the house on G Street. And let me just finish with two, two, two two uh, clarifications here, and then I'll take questions. If there aren't really a lot of questions, then I'll read some more, but you know, I wanna make sure that we have questions. Do things, this is not historical fiction. You know, as I have, I have, in other words, uh, there, are, there are some people that I admire very much uh, who write, who take these sort of real events and write a novel in which they have, you know, dialogue and everything, and they have, you know, they write historical fiction around that. That is not this, this is a nonfiction book, right? I try to stick to the facts because in fact, if I'm going to leave a legacy for you know, my descendants of the family, I don't wanna make stuff up. And as, soci as a sociologist, I can't make stuff up. It's like I can't do it, 
You know what I'm saying? You know, this idea of inventing dialogue and inviting, I, I can't do it, right? It's just, I, I should, maybe it would sell better, but I just, I, I don't know. So this is, a, this is a book, and I do have stories and I have anecdotes and so forth, right? But they're based on the information that I know to be true. Right? The other thing that I want to clarify is, this is not a book about exile resentment. This is not about, oh, look what was, you know, what was the past, and now, you know, as immigrants, we resent the fact, right? We are now victims, right? And we resent the fact that, you know, the revolution came in and changed everything, right? I don't, I don't have that. There is a nostalgia about the book, right? But I don't engage in judgments about, you know, whether things are better, worse, you know, anything. It was what it was, right? It is what it is. All right, and that's that's sort of you know the basis, and that's sort of why you know I don't deal with that. Uh, that is so common among a lot of literature that's written by exiles, particularly Cuban exiles, about oh look at you know what happened to our poor island, look at what they did, look at what that's not that's not in here, right? That's not what what this is about. So I and let me see if there are any questions, uh, and then. Again, if there aren't a lot of questions, I'll just continue reading. But I want to make sure I don't want to just, I mean, I, I wrote a whole book, so I could just go on, you know? I mean, it, anyways, thank you. I, I just, uh, let me add one thing. And in, in sometimes in book presentations, the book is available. Uh, but the logistics of that are just to, it would involve, you know, bringing the books and then maybe I buy them on my, you know, discount and then sell them for, you know, whatever cash and, you know, it's just, but I do have, this is now the selling part of this, uh, I have, I have <laughs> cards that the publisher gave me and if you go to their website, uh, you can get 30% off with this code, okay? So if any of you, I have them up here at the end, if any of you are interested, you can pick one up and you get 30% off uh, ordering directly from NYU Press. And I went with NYU Press, by the way. Uh, I had thought of maybe trying a trade publisher or whatever, but NYU Press really, um, they did a great job with, uh, with my previous book. And they're, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too keen on their marketing, uh, frankly, but in terms of the physical production of the book, right, they do a really good job. The editing process, the whole thing is, is really good and the physical characteristic of the book is really good. Anyway. So but can I, I, can yes, I take the privilege yes, <coughs> of uh, being up here <coughs> of one to say, <coughs> sorry, yeah. that um, I know you're a sociologist, yeah. um, but uh, I really claim you as a historian okay, thank <laughs> because uh, this is really, it is a magnificent history of Cuba. I mean, as you say, it is a micro history. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but it really gives you a sense of uh, life in Cuba. I mean, for me, mostly the, the 20th century, mm -hmm. but also somewhat in the uh, late 19th century. But as part of that, and, and let me just say, the section on um, the production of tobacco, that, that chapter is incredible. Uh, I mean, I just had no idea of one, how long the care, the different elements, the different places, you know, from central Cuba to Havana, storing it, it, you know, it just was really magnificent. But one thing you didn't talk about and that I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit about is you were living through mm -hmm. the revolution uh, and you talk about it in, mm -hmm. in the book. I wonder if you could just talk a, a little bit about okay what that was like for you, um, you know, living through the revolution uh, that, that okay. came to Cuba. Yeah, I, and again, when, when you refer to living through the revolution, I, it's actually what led up to it, and then, you know, the 1959, we leave in October 1960, right? So it's already a couple of years after January 1st, 1959, when, when the Cuban revolution takes place. But my earliest memories, uh, I think one of the things that happens, um, Ch children who live in, in countries that are become politically convulsive, right, uh, have a great deal more awareness of what's going on, right? 
I think that when you live in a, in a, in a relatively sort of stable, say, democracy and so forth. And so, yeah, kids may, may not know the name of the president of the United States or whatever, right? You know, they don't. But if you live, if you grow up in a place that, that is convulsed with, as, as happened, started happening in Havana especially, where I live, starting at about 1956 or so, uh, you remember that and you become very politically conscious, right, of that. Um, so my first episode for that, I was in third grade, and I say this, I talk, again, I was going to an American school. I had been in this American school since kindergarten. Uh, I, I was, this was an American school that I went to. Half of the students were Cuban, half of the students were Americans. We had instruction in English and Spanish. One good day, we're, uh, and the date, I th believe, is October 1956. October 1956, we're reading uh, and my school was located at that time, later it relocated to the outskirts of Havana, but at that time in 1956 it was still in Miramar on Quinta Avenida. So it was a very centrally located place in, uh, in Havana. Uh, and uh, we were reading out of a geography textbook uh, in English, right? a story that was really very exotic, which was this father and his son collecting maple syrup in Vermont. <laughs> if you can imagine, right, how that, you know, how, how exotic that was. All of a sudden, we start hearing what may seem like the backfire of motorcycles, right? Uh, and they went on and on. They, they were not, like, right next to the school, but they were not far off. And what had happened on that day was that the, uh, but Fulgencio Batista's police, and again, Batista was the president of Cuba, let's say the, the, the chief executive of Cuba uh, at that time, right? Um, uh, Batista's police decided they were going to raid the Haitian embassy uh, because they believed that there were in the Haitian embassy uh, individuals who were opponents of the regime that had hidden there. And it was true, they were actually, not the ones they were looking for, but others, and they were armed. So it was a gun battle that lasted for about 45 minutes. The chief of police ended up dead, right? But we were like, Okay, what happened here? Because we had to obviously move away from the windows. You know, we had to go downstairs to a secure room. I mean, it was like, you know, sounds of bullets all over the place, sounds of bullets, uh, of gunshots all over the, the place. And, uh, and after that is when I asked myself, what, what is going on in this country, right? And this is the time in, that in which that marked the beginning, that the event marked the beginning of essentially a... a actions by the opponents of Batista in the capital city to overthrow him. And my parents would say, do not touch, right, packages that you see on the street, right? In other words, don't be touching packages in the street. Uh, we would hear gunfire at night sometimes in Miramar far away, right? So this was started a period of a lot of convulsion in which you became aware and in my house in Miramar, we didn't have a lot of books. My grandfather had a lot of books and I went to his house for books. But we had basically the press. My father did was a press. He got in several daily newspapers. So I started consuming all of this. I was seven or eight, right? But on January 1st, 1959, which is, of course, the day that morning that Fulgencio Batista leaves, you know, I noticed I hadn't been awakened. You know, you know, I, I was, you know, it was a deafening silence. And I go into my parents' bedroom, and they're listening to the radio, and. Uh, and my father turns to me and says, el hombre se fue. The man left. There was no further explanation needed. And it was, I didn't need to be explained, be given a lesson in history or whatever. I knew exactly what that meant. That is, I had reached a level of political consciousness, if you will, although at that time I was not even 10 years old, where I knew what that meant, right? And so we went through this whole period. Uh, and then afterwards, things again start to change again. Things again become unstable. Uh, my family, my father particularly, had welcomed the, revolu the revolution. And uh, I think part of what I talk about there as to how people became alienated differently from the process is important. Because my uncle Ruben, for example, who inherited the management of the cigar company, of the tobacco company, and was affiliated with the U.S., he was looking at all this like, whoa, right? from the very beginning in 59, I don't like this, right? And he left rather early, right? We didn't leave until October 1960. What happened, what happened at that point, right, is that 
those, a lot of people who supported the revolution, right? Uh, the revolution had turned, uh, in, had gone a way that they had not anticipated it would go. And once it, they crossed their line, whatever that line was, for my uncle Ruben, that was the expropriation of U.S. companies. My father was okay with that. He was an ortodoxo, which means he was, a, you know, the opposition party. He was okay with that. His line was different. His line came when they said, we're going to nationalize schools. Well, you see, that, that now said there's going to be some sort of, you know, uh, government interference in how you put, educate your children and whatever. And that was his line. And when that line was crossed, that's when people left. And that's why it disproportionately affected people of upper socioeconomic sectors whose line, right, was drawn rather tightly around what was happening in Cuba. Besides, we were going to go back. I mean, given the history that I talk about, right, given the history that I talk about, it was not going to be possible for this revolutionary experiment to survive right here in front of the U.S. because the U.S. had, throughout Cuban history, demonstrated a disposition, a willingness to intervene, right, to intervene to make sure things went, you know, the right way. And it was just not going to happen. And, you know, if you told in 19, if you, if you picked up, if you, if you uh, came across somebody in 1957, let's say you stopped somebody in Cuba in 1957 in front of the Yara, uh, the Radio Centro, whatever, said, let me tell you what's going to happen in this country <laughs> in the next 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, they would not believe it right, in terms of what actually happened. Right? That was something that, that nobody thought was going to take place. And so that's the part where the memoir comes in. But again, I don't depend just on my memory. I'm also doing the research. For example, what happened on that October day in 1956? Well, I went to the newspapers, right, that are in the libraries. And I went to the newspapers and I said, okay, this is what happened. That's why they attacked the Haitian embassy and whatnot. What I've tried to do in this book is do a seamless narrative. That is, I don't say, okay, according to my memory, this, and then, of course, I looked it up it's like one story that I hope is being told seamlessly. Right? Anyway, thank you for that question. I hope that answers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ab absolutely. So question? Yes. Go ahead. I, I, I want to introduce a Belmont Freeman, uh, who is actually Cuban, despite his name. He's an architect, right? Right. And he's done a lot of magnificent mm -hmm. projects in New York. And one of the things that we're familiar with is that he uh, uh, up, um, totally redid this recreation center across the street, right? Oh, the that's old right. bathhouse. Thanks for remembering that. 59 uh, Gertrude Adderley Rec Center. Yeah. It's yeah, Neil. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Lisandro, I, I, I read your, this, your latest book, absolutely loved it, maybe more than the others, largely because it's so personal. Yeah. And you could, you could have been writing about my family, yeah. including the great grandfather. Um, Gonzalez, who made a fortune raising cattle in San Espiritu mm. before yeah. moving to uh, Havana, yeah. versus the Cigarroa, yeah. great grandfather who came from the Basque country yeah. and made his money doing business with the Spanish colonial government and then the Republican government. And um, and I was tickled to learn that you know my my grandfather built a house on H Street. H, yes, between. 13th and 15th, and I have to look at the map, but the, the, the rear property lines probably touched each other. Yeah, yeah. And, and I too took my mother back to Havana in the year 2000 when she was turning 80. Oh, wow. I mean, the parallels are yeah. just mind-blowing. Yeah. But being an architect, I'm interested in the house, which um, built in 1929, and I've walked by the house many times. Yeah. Um, it's sort of an old-fashioned house for 1929. Yeah. And uh, you told me that he ordered it up from a construction company yeah. based obviously on an old a design that could have been 10 or 20 years yeah. earlier. Yeah. Um, and in your book, you mentioned that the fonts, if I remember correctly, um, grandparents lived in an apartment or, th I mean, where did they live? I mean, and it, does this reflect yeah. different sort of attitudes towards modernity yeah. uh, and acceptance of, of modernism, 
uh, from yeah. in that generation from these two different um, families of, yeah. of uh, different backgrounds? Yeah, I think that one of the contrasts between the, the two families is, is that the Fonts had less money. Yeah. Again, again, those who came as veterans out of the war did not have you know, accumulated wealth, whereas my grandfather on my father's side had been accumulating this wealth through this tobacco business. So one of the differences in the house that they lived, uh, actually, originally, the colonel lived in El Cerro. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, and, yeah, in El Cerro, where a lot of, uh, but he had to sell that house. Once, once his political par party, and he was you know, affiliated with Menocala and the conservative party, once his political party was out of power, Right? He was out of government job because the government jobs were all determined by what political party. Right? Uh, there was no civil service. Yeah. Right? So, so they had less money. And I think that's reflected. The thing about you saying about the house on G Street is really curious. Uh, my grandfather, who again had grown up in central Cuba and had this work ethic and so forth, he moved to Havana finally to take care of his business when he was already in his 50s. Right? So he, ca he never abandoned the sort of you know, simplicity and the values of his rural life. In fact, he, he, he sort of inculcated that into his children, right? Not to be you know, giving the frivolities of the capital city. So that house, right? You, it's very different from a house in Vedao in the sense that houses in Vedao have Corinthian columns and they're very ornate and whatever. This is a very functional house built by an American engineering company, right? And it's very functional. It has a central hallway, right? And all the bedrooms come out to the central hallway, you know, a foyer, a, 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 a uh, library, a living room, and then the kitchen in the back and the dining room. It's a very functional house. It has no, no cherubic, you know, angels protruding from cornices or anything like that. It's very, and that, I think, reflects his sort of austerity in many ways and the way in which he was able to build this, this, uh, this fortune, right? And, and, uh, and I think, it, and when I went back with my father, he wanted to go to a house in La Vibora where they had lived before. And this was a house that would have been built in 1900, right? To what you're saying about an old design. He realized that my father, looking at that house, said, this is where the plan for that house came from because it was a house in La Vibora that had exactly the same plan, right? And that's what he built in, in the house in Medao. Yeah. I even have the address of that house. Yeah. And then, and then your, the, the, the fonts, um, grandparents, where was their? Uh, well, my, uh, my grandparents lived in Miramar on 18th between uh, 5th and 7th. Okay. Uh, and, and it was a small, relatively small house. I have a picture of it in the book, yeah. Yep. Que mas? Yeah. But they, made, they later moved to El Country. Yeah, they moved later to El Country, right? Okay. Right. They, they, they made, he, he, did, he did build, my grandfather did build in mid century, right? Out in the, in the countryside. The, 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 the one on the font side. Oh, the font side. Yeah. yeah. But again, it was a more. It was a more uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, hello, Professor. Uh, yeah. uh, were there any challenges you faced when writing the book? Oh, I'm sorry? Were there any challenges you faced when writing the book? Oh, yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, doing the, uh, one thing about, at least for me, you know, uh, what's really exciting is doing the research, right? You go and, 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 and you know, Madrid, you have, you know, I found the, 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 uh, the folio of the, of the, grand, the great, great grandfather who had been deported, right? And, and then to find, you know, exactly I don't think this book would have been possible without things like ancestry and the internet and all that, right? For example, let me give you an example of how I worked that in, right? And I'll get to your question in a minute, but the really exciting thing is doing research because I always heard the story that my grandparents met, right, in a party, right, in New York, in Manhattan. That was my grandparents on my mother's side, right? And I said, okay, well, my grandfather was here studying at New York Military Academy. If they met in New York, then my grandmother had to at some point be in New York even though she lived in Cuba. Okay, passenger lists, right? Right? You find her, you find out when, right? They, she came in, that's when they met at this, p at this party, 
And not only that, the address of where they were staying, that's where the party took place. That's where they met. I was able to place that party uh, next. Uh, uh, right across the street. Right across the street from where Jerry <laughs> lives up in 110th. 110th. Right? And under 11, excuse <laughs> me, right? So that's part of the reason. So th that part is fun. What's hard is writing, <laughs> right? What's hard is writing. <laughs> that is when, you know, you have to have the discipline to sit down every day and write, right? And, and my wife says, you know, tu te metes en esa oficina, you know, and like, it's like, you know, you get into that office and you just grow roots there, right? Uh, essentially, you know, right? Because, uh, you know, it's just the writing that's hard because the, hard, the writing, you have to, the research is exciting, you're finding out things. The writing is when you have to really see how you can say things in a way that's really attractive, right? And I try to get away from the idea that, for example, social scientists can't write well. I try to write well. My major professor uh, once was criticized by a journal because they found his writing pedestrian. And, he's, and he said, well, if I knew how to write, I wouldn't be a sociologist. <laughs> 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 you know? So I try, I try to kind of, you know, I try to, you know, make, and that's hard. That's what's hard, right? And then in this case, I had a challenge. One of the challenges I had is that in my first book, in the first book on sugar, the copy editor that the breast had, the copy editor, uh, liked how I wrote and did everything right. This copy editor for this book, like almost totally transformed my manuscript in a ways that I didn't recognize it. I mean, and even in weird ways, right? Like I don't, I, don't use, I don't use dashes to set off text in a sentence. I use commas. She put all dashes. I said, I don't recognize that. That's not the way I write, right? She even changed the quotes. I was quoting people from the 19th century, right? And she changed the quotes. So you can't change the quotes. <laughs> That's why. I mean, maybe they didn't say it the right way. So it's a very, very, it was very aggressive editing, and I, I turned it all back. I said, I'm sorry, you have to start over. So that those are challenges, and it comes at the writing stage, right? Yes, team, but go on top. I have a question that's about both the disciplinary boundaries right. and also the academic and non-academic publics um, mm -hmm. and where those lines are. And it seems, I, I guess one of them is like what kind of, beyond this embrace, but what kind of challenges have you faced in not being a historian but writing history right. and then also in speaking to various publics because I think this is a book that is, is, is on that line, along that line. Right, and, and I debated whether I should send it to a trade publisher as opposed to sending it to NYU Press. Uh, it was hard placing it in, in trade publishing because for a trade publisher you need an agent. And one has no idea. You know, if you're an academic, you have no idea how this works, right? Of agents and whatever and, and all of that. Um, um, so, uh, it was a hard book for an agent to take on, and they didn't tell me they didn't like it. What they told me is, I kind of don't know where to put this, <laughs> right? In other words, I, this is, yeah, I mean, it's got like hundreds of footnotes, endnotes, right? It's been researched, it's academic, whatever, but at the same time, it's in the first person, right? So is this a memoir? Well, no, it's not really a memoir. It's, you know, it's, uh, what is it, right? And so I had a hard time. So finally, my wife said, send it to who appreciates you. So I sent it to NYU Press, whom I knew. And of course, they, they liked it right away because it was an academic, it was, it was an academic book with all the footnotes and everything, but written in a way that might have a broader audience. I think, you know, the book only came out in October. So I don't know yet, uh, for example, if it does have a wider audience, it has, it has sold far better than their titles that are strictly academic, uh, but still some of the reviews are not out. I understand there's one coming out from the Hispanic American Historical Review, right, and so forth. So, so I, I haven't been able to really tell, you know, whether this, how it's been received, and I'm kind of waiting for that because, again, one of the criticisms, I, I can see some criticisms of the book in terms of it's neither one nor the other, it's a, it's a focus on, on this history it's, uh, that's from a particular perspective. And also, uh, I think 
the previous book and this one has also been criticized on the basis that an e it has an elite perspective, right? This does not have the story. I try to integrate stories of individuals who cross the path of my family who represent, for example, uh, uh, minorities, eth you know, ethnic racial minorities in Cuba. And I try to do that story, but that's essentially not the story here. Just like the book on Cuba and New York talked primarily about the families of the people who were trading with sugar. Well, that was the origin of the community. It's not that I'm trying. Now, there is a broader story, and I try to tell that as well. But, but I, I'm not, I don't get a sense yet right, of, of how it's been received. It's too, a little too early. Anybody else? Okay. Great. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you on behalf of the Office for the Advancement of Research. Oh, okay. One more. Question. Yeah, sure. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've got time. I guess it is a question. Hello, Professor. Hi, how, how are you? you? Long time yeah. I'll see. Yeah, well, it's his last semester, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. So I'm interested in your book, and I want to say, well, it is opinion, but thank you for being my professor from, from last semester. Oh, thank you. And I learned a lot from you. And what I learned so far is that you are really are into history so much in the Spanish, uh, Lat Latino American. So that's why I want to ask you, in this book, does it sh talk about your your passion about teaching? Others like becoming a professor or no? Uh, I think I think. Uh, thank you for that question and thank you for your kind words about my teaching. I'm just sorry the provost left. Uh, <laughs> <all right. laughs> but uh, but there are it's others. There, there, there are it's others here. That's right. We just said that on. Um, I, I think that one of the things that I that I do in the memoir part, uh, where I do spend quite a bit of, of time talking about my uh, that bilingual bicultural school that I attended, right and. And that, again, that was a world that now I look back on it, and to me at that time it seemed perfectly normal, right? But, I mean, I had, you know, students in there who were Cubans, uh, and then there were these students who were Americans, right? And they, they went to things like tap classes, you know what I'm saying? In other words, the, the entire Ameri there was an entire American colony in Cuba. And again, that's a story that I'm sure a lot of people in Cuba now would say, really? Right, there were entire sections of Havana, right, where Americans lived. I mean, I, I went trick-or-treating one time without knowing even what it was. You know what I'm saying? And they put us in a car and they drove us around this neighborhood and we collected candy from these people and I didn't know anything about that, right? So, so I had this sort of experience. I talked quite a bit about the school. And I think in, that, in talking about it, I emphasize a lot the teachers, to going to your story. I think, I think that, that those teachers, even though they, they had very different perspectives. Uh, I remember I told the story there about Ms. Tetzeli. Ms. Tetzeli taught sixth grade U.S. history. The textbook was this thick, U.S. history in sixth grade, right? And she walked in, she was a, a redhead totally f covered in freckles, right? And she walked in, she couldn't be more American. She looked like something out of the Technicolor films that, you know, coming out of Hollywood at the time, right? And she would, of course, talk about American invincibility and so forth, right? Uh, and all these wars that Americans had won and everything else. And I said, yeah, great. And then there was uh, a Senora Valdez. And a Senora Valdez, you know, she taught us in the afternoon, just us Cuban kids, because you, the American kids could choose to go on another track and have English the whole day, right? So it was they don't need the Cuban kids in the afternoon. And Senora Valdez gave us this sort of nationalistic Cuban history, right? You know, uh, uh, of, about how, you know, the heroism of the, of the patriots of the revolution back in you know the 1890s, and she even said one time, I have this in the book, that that Cuba stood on its own continental shelf, and therefore it was entitled to be the sixth continent. <laughs> you know that kind of, you know that kind of, you know sort of ethno, you know uh, whatever. And it was it was great, but I think I was very much influenced by these people, right? Uh, and I think that may have had a role in. I was going to be a lawyer when I went into college, but. Uh, I later, s I really liked history, I liked social sciences, and when I entered uh, my undergraduate years, I said, these professors, they actually live from this, 
<laughs> right? In other words, they make a living, right, out of doing history and social science. I want to do that. I don't want to study law. Right? Can I follow up yeah. on that on that question, uh, Lissandro? Um, how did you reconcile those two conflicting views yeah. by these two teachers? I, I think that was part. I mean, I knew no differently. In other words, I, that was essentially what uh, I appreciated that there was this world out there that that there was an entire American colonia in Cuba, right? Colony in which in which they had their life and and they many of them lived in country, right? In areas of what is now Cibone and so forth in Cuba. That was a whole American sort of area, and they had their own life, and I understood that. But again, I think that uh, I did have an identity as Cuban uh, from the beginning, and, and that goes to, together with the identity of my, my grandfather. Right? Uh, my grandfather on my mother's side, my, who had a great influence on my life, the son of the colonel, right? my, my mother's father, uh, was an individual who was a fan of US, of everything US. Right? He would go to a special market in Cuba that sold sliced bread, you know, and 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 beets, canned beets. He was educated in the Hudson Valley, right? And he and he bought the Saturday Evening Post, you know, with the Roman Rockwell uh, uh, covers. I mean, the whole thing, right? He was he was, uh, into, but he would never lost his identity. He was remembered that he was the son of a of a of someone who fought in the War of Independence, and he always referred to the Americans not as us, but los americanos, esos americanos. Esos americanos son algo serio, right? That kind of stuff, like that. For example, he never, he never, he, he could never figure out why they liked Jerry Lewis, <laughs> which he found. You know, some of you might not know who Jerry Lewis is, but, but, but he couldn't figure out why you know such a great nation would actually <laughs> like this kind of humor, right? So he always, he, he always said, and I think that was part of it. I think we had an identity as Cubans, but, but again, this was this other world that was part of my existence since I was in kindergarten. And had been part of the existence of my father, my grandfather, my great grandfather, who had all studied in the U.S. Right? And I remember hearing the stories about you know them going to the U.S. So this is not a. T I mean, again, this family is not necessarily typical, right? I'm not saying it's typical, but it is, in many ways, typical of that class at that time. And to s to restate that, that is a lost world, right? That is essentially a lost world. Maybe good riddance. Fine, I'm not judging that, right? But it's 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 essentially chronically that sort of lost world. Right? Yeah. All right. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. Oh. Sorry. No, let's go ahead and take it. Anybody, uh, my students will probably want to leave. The you know, very they, last one. They've already signed in. By the way, if you haven't <laughs> signed in, right? I have the list. If you're in my classes. Right? For extra credit, you need to sign up. Yes, go ahead. You have answered it before I even formulated it. Okay. I haven't gotten that far in your book. I'm still okay. in the early republic. Okay. But the American school just seems totally fascinating to me mm -hmm. and has for a very long time since I just seem to know so many people, Cubans and Americans, who went to that school. Yeah. And I just, I was going to ask you if that, if anyone has done a history or a memoir of the American school or whether that might be the next project. Ag again, again, interesting. In that social history of that world uh, prior to the revolution, I think nobody's writing sort of about it, right? Uh, and uh, back, back to Monty's point about that this story is ref very much his story ref is reflected in this story. I think there are a lot of things here, and, and a lot of people, my contemporaries, uh, Cubans, have told me that. You know, this is exactly, you know, I, I identify with this story. Right. This is a story that 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 uh, that I uh, know something about, and like I said, my family was totally like, "Gee, we didn't." There was things in here that they didn't know, so I've dug up some stuff. I'm not sure they liked all of it, but you know. great. Okay. Thank you Thank so you. much, Thank Dr. You. Perez. I have, I have cards here, and if you are one of my students currently, uh, sign in, please. Uh, we do have another book talk on April 10 in the Mood Court by Dr. Bettina Cabanel. It's about the consequential museums. If you wish to attend, please let me know, but I will definitely be reaching out to you with the information. And we have snacks at the and back. Feel free to grab some Melanie, and to take some home. Thank you.
And there's food. Have the food. Right. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Thank you.